people need to know you will be checked. There is such a thing as what is true, and you will be held accountable for that. From Christianity Today, you're listening to The Bulletin, a podcast about the people, events, and issues that are shaping our world. I'm Clarissa Mall, producer and moderator of The Bulletin. In this episode, Nicole Martin, fresh from the Lausanne Conference on Global Missions in Korea, joins Russell Moore, Mike Cosper, and me to talk about Tuesday's vice presidential debate. Next, I sit down with Knox Thames to discuss a new report on Christian persecution and global religious freedom. Finally, Russell, Mike, Nicole, and I explore the quirks and quandaries of celebrity conversions and Christianity that seeks a platform. Welcome to the show. On Tuesday evening, vice presidential hopefuls J.D. Vance and Tim Walz faced off in the only VP debate of this election season. While reports have implied that Vance and Walz had a strong distaste for each other, the debate on Tuesday was, in the words of New York Times columnist Josh Barrow, remarkably civil, policy-focused, and normal. He said it's a preview of what politics might look like someday when we have an election not involving Trump. In other words, maybe a little bit boring? Joining us to recap the night and consider its implications for the upcoming election is our dear friend of the Bulletin, CT's Chief Impact Officer, Nicole Martin. Nicole, thanks for being with us today. So glad to be here. So, Nicole, I know that you were at Lausanne over in South Korea, and you're probably still experiencing jet lag. So I'm curious who you thought won Tuesday's debate, and did you yawn your way through it? It did strike me as, quote, normal, and I was thinking... It is nice to have civil dialogue. But the thing that stood out to me that I wrestled with is what do we do when society has taught us to see winning as aggression and winning as avoiding questions? Because if society has taught us that winning looks like being really dogmatic and aggressive and no, you don't have to answer questions, then perhaps Vance won. However, if we are taught to believe that what a person says is more important than how they say it or how they come off, then I do think Waltz won. Russell, when you think about Tuesday's event, did you see a clear winner or loser? Well, I think that the the really important thing in any vice presidential debate is not what's going on during the debate. It's what happens with the clips that are then passed around later. I think in this debate, there were two, and the two were when J.D. Vance says, I thought we were told that there would not be fact-checking after he went back to the comments about Haitian immigrants. And the second, and probably more important given the other news of the week, is when he refused to say that Trump lost the 2020 election and said, I'm, I'm looking to the future, not looking to the past, and that there was a peaceful transfer of power in 2020, 2021, which there, of course, was not. I think that is what really is going to last and persist, not who made a better point here and there. Because the, the really important question about the vice presidential debate this week is who was not there. And Mike Pence was not there. And the fundamental question was, why not? And between this debate and then the Jack Smith charges that have been released this week, saying to Pence, you're too honest, reportedly when told that Pence was in mortal jeopardy, saying, so what? I think that's what's really going to have a lasting effect here. Mike, as Russell mentions that absence of Mike Pence, I think about Donald Trump's comments on Wednesday morning after the debate was over. He said, J.D. did fantastic last night. It just reconfirmed my choice. He was brilliant. And we saw Donald Trump turn on Mike Pence when it served his purposes. And I wonder, can this glow last for very long for J.D. Vance? Or has the praise of his performance actually sort of put him in the crosshairs when Trump decides that he's competition for the spotlight? Yeah, I think that's very likely to be the case. It was interesting that if you were following what was going on on social media, right-wing social media was having a field day you know, high-fiving over Vance's performance on Tuesday night during the debate, Trump was tweeting about Pete Rose. (laughs) So it tells you how Trump feels about somebody else taking the spotlight. Part of what was fascinating about the debate was Vance's code switching. 
Because Vance, up to this point, you know, what we know of him, he kind of became famous and important to the Trumpy right through countless appearances on podcasts that are very right wing, that are very inflammatory, getting on there and saying things, you know, all the clips that we've seen so far about childless cat ladies and all the rest. And part of what we saw, you know, if you if you watch the debate, one of the things that was very noticeable, Walt seemed very nervous and uncomfortable, especially at the beginning. The national stage is new for him. And then I think one of the things that threw him off was the fact that the J.D. Vance that showed up on that stage was very respectful, very polite, deferential, even gentlemanly, kept talking about all the things he agreed with Walls on before he would distance himself and make his own points. I think part of what we saw is that Vance is a very, very, very savvy political character and meant to go into that room and change his perception with people who are going to watch the debate but aren't going to watch him at the rally the next day when he went right back into right-wing troll mode. And yet, well, the polling data that we have so far is showing that uh, the vast majority of people think it was pretty much a draw when it comes to the points debate but they like walls better than they did before the debate, which is one of those things I think we have to remember. I think about in 2016, the Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump debates after the end of those, everyone would say, well, Hillary Clinton just absolutely smoked him on issues and poise and so forth. But that's not what mattered. What mattered was that people were really drawn to the way that Trump would. I'm not the puppet. You're the puppet. I don't pay my taxes because I'm smart. And that persona worked. Question is, what does this really do for Vance's childless cat lady's overall persona? And I'm not sure it's going to do much. Through all three debates, fact-checking by moderators has been a feature that has frustrated the candidates. It's frustrated viewers at times. It's enthused others. And I wonder, in an age where sort of facts are what you decide they are. Do you think that this feature of the debate has served a helpful purpose? And I think particularly for folks like in the Black community who have long struggled with an institutional distrust when it comes to politicians anyways. Absolutely. If we get rid of fact checking, then what is true? The challenge, though, is the larger issue of, quote, what is true. You know, there's an understanding of what is common. And I feel like that's gotten lost. Anyone could say at any time that what is true is false. I remember actually being asked, so isn't it true that Haitians do eat animals? And isn't it true that people in the Philippines do have dog with gravy and rice? Like, help me understand where you're getting your facts from. If there is no central moderator for these kinds of conversations, then anything is true. And the other thing that worries me is even when the moderator fact checks, even when someone is proven wrong, there's always a space in social media life where you can say, yeah, but those people don't know what they talk about. And there's always 100,000 people that will say you're right. That quote unquote truth is not right. I don't like the fact checking. And the reason I don't like it is because there are so many lies and distortions flying, especially right now, that you're not going to be able to have fact checking without having a debate between the moderators and the candidates. And what ends up happening is then when there are not facts that are checked, they're assumed to be true. Now, the exception I would make is the exception they made the other night. Because this is a situation where you have human lives that are imperiled with the kinds of threats that are coming against Haitian migrants in Springfield and in other places. I think that that rises to a level where it actually was appropriate for the moderators to say, that's not happening. They're not abducting cats and dogs. They're not doing all these things in the community. But other than that, I think it's really, really difficult to try to do. If you're going to say we're going to be fact-checking what these candidates say, you have to really be able to do it. And I'm just not sure any group of moderators can do that. CNN, you know, made this very deliberate choice to say, we're not going to fact check. It's all going to fly. These guys need to fact check each other. I think that was effective on that level. And people have given Vance a really hard time over him saying it was the equivalent of, I was told there would be no math, you know, um, (laughs) I was told there would not be fact checking. And and at the same time, I mean, I've said plenty about how I feel about Vance on this show. At the same time, because he was fact-checked in the way that he was, 
he then jumps in to go, well, actually, you know, and, and the argument he was making, he had a point, not about the, the cats, not about any of that nonsense, because that stuff is, is nonsense. But what they fact checked him on was him saying that these Haitians were illegal immigrants. And he jumped in to say, look, they came in illegally. And then there was a program that granted them this status after the fact. They didn't actually go through a process. And I object to that being the standard. And so, again, to me, I would actually say, like, I think they would have been better off in that scenario just not to fact check it, leave it to the candidate, leave it to Walls to make the correction or to, or to challenge it and let them debate that out, the morality of granting refugees a status after the fact. I do think it was a bad look for Vance. I think it was a bad look for the moderators as well. One thing they did try to debate out a little bit was January 6th, right? And this week, the federal district court unsealed these documents supporting special counsel Jack Smith's case. And Russell, it's hard to believe that new details revealed here are going to change anybody's minds. Is that instinct right? Yeah. I mean, I think we're at a point right now where people have made the determination whether or not they're going to willfully forget what happened on January 6th or not. But I do think that it sort of represents to the people what a lot of people are trying to forget. And there are some new information here. The so what language, which is really chilling. The language about it doesn't matter whether we won or, or lost. We've got to fight like hell. And then what I think is sort of being missed, but might be the most important factor here is that Jack Smith has the cell phone data and knows exactly what the then president was looking at on Twitter while all of this violence was going on. So I think what it really communicates is for a lot of people who assume, well, the Supreme Court decision means that this is all gone, which was not the case, that that's not true. This is still going forward. And I think the main effect it's going to have is not going to be on voters. There aren't a lot of undecided voters out there, although the ones that are, are going to be important. It's more important about the sense of desperation that Trump has, because I think he knows if he loses the election, he's going to be going to trial and it's going to be bad. And it also, I think, raises the stakes for everyone else to say if he wins, he says he's going to pardon these January 6th, as he calls them, hostages. Does that matter? So it, it might be more important for the people who have made their minds up one way or the other than it will be for the undecideds. The people who are saying, like Vance, I'm just looking to the future. Yeah. I mean, I saw someone posted on social media today that he's going to say next time he's pulled over for speeding, you know, that was in the past. I'm just looking to the future. <laughs> <laughs> Very cheeky. <laughs> well, two of the topics that were noticeably absent from the debate on Tuesday were U.S.-China relations and the Russia-Ukraine war. And Mike, I'm wondering... You've done a lot of reporting on both. Why do you think that the conversation avoided these topics that are really sort of the greatest geopolitical threats to the U.S. right now? Why do I think it happened? I have no clue why you wouldn't ask the leading critic of American support for Ukraine why he does not support aiding Ukraine in their war against Russian aggression. I found that shocking that they didn't ask a single question about that. There's a lot of polling out there about, you know, what are the issues that voters are concerned about? Near the bottom of the list that the general public is concerned about is climate change. We got eight minutes on climate change and not one question about Russia, Ukraine. I'm not saying I don't care about climate change. I care a lot about it. I think it's an issue we need to think seriously about and Christians need to be discerning about. But again, to not address this issue in a time where if Russian aggression goes unchecked, Eastern Europe is in serious peril. And if Eastern Europe is in serious peril, that means war for us. I think it was just a true dereliction of duty on the part of the moderators not to ask about it. David French made a point in his column this week that while the VP debates don't have any impact on elections, they are instructive for us. And as we close this conversation, Nicole, I wonder if Tuesday night was a sort of teachable moment. What do you think we should have learned from what we saw? Facts really do matter. And I, I still do think that fact checking, for example, has to happen for the very simple fact that people need to know you will be checked. There is such a thing as what is true and you will be held accountable for that. 
I think there's also a lesson that there's a place to be, quote unquote, Minnesota nice. And then there's a place to say, no, you're not going to talk to me like that. (laughs) I think especially for those of us who are really aiming towards civil dialogue and really trying to be peacemakers, there is a time to say nothing and to be silent when things are said about you that aren't true. And then there's a time to speak up and say, actually, I'm going to correct you on that. That was a major takeaway for me, especially as I'm thinking about Christian dialogue, as I'm thinking about the places where we disagree. I have a lot of friends who are still very, very pro-Trump and pro-Vance, and it's important to know that there's a time to say, look, I'm not going to argue with you about that. And then there's a time to say, no, we're going to talk about this because what you just said is not only wrong, but it's also not true. So that was that's my main takeaway. My main takeaway is where I started, and that is who was not on the platform that night. I talked to Mike Pence, I think January 7th, right after his life and his family's life were in serious, serious jeopardy. And he made a decision that he could not violate the United States Constitution or his own conscience. And when Donald Trump told him, as we have in the Jack Smith filing, millions of people are going to hate you from now on. That's true. And Mike Pence knew it then. And so I think the question looking at this is, who would you rather be? Would you rather be the person on the platform right now? Or would you rather be the person who, whatever you think of Mike Pence and his politics, did what he believed to be right and lived up to his oath? And I think regardless of politics, we all ought to think about the long term, every idle word, every idle action coming before the judgment seat of Christ. That's important. A lot of people have been asking whether or not J.D. Vance is the future of the party, and Vance certainly is is vying for that role. But what I actually think the takeaway for J.D. Vance this week is, is that he is a fraud. I don't say that lightly, but if you go back to the beginning of when J.D. Vance first appeared on the national stage, and you read his book, Hillbilly Elegy, this story of this hard scrabble upbringing, really an American dream story a patriotic story of service to country, of rising from a tough place and doing hard things and taking personal responsibility. You then have him make this code shift in the Trump years where basically he's to this community that his book was saying, make the moral choices, do the hard things, and you can rise from your circumstances. He then switches to telling them, the government is keeping you down, and immigrants and minorities and liberals are keeping you down, and all of your suffering is their fault. He becomes a right-wing troll. He becomes this podcast bro. And then Tuesday night, he shows up, and he's J.D. Vance from the Yale Debate Club. Gentlemanly, polite, deferential, you know, well-presented, well-dressed in his pink tie to soften him up for women who hate him, which I don't think worked. And then Wednesday morning, he goes back out on the road and he goes back to the podium and he's right back to the right-wing troll. Do I think that guy is the future of the party? No, not a chance. The reason Donald Trump holds such a profoundly compelling place on that party is that he's always Donald Trump. Night and day, day and night, awake, asleep, wherever he is, he's Donald Trump. And there's something about that sort of sense of authenticity that people have locked into and loved. Vance seems to think that he can perform and become all things to all people, and it doesn't work. Well, listeners, we know that you may still be deciding who to vote for this year, and we're excited to bring you a special mini-series from us here at The Bulletin called Stop, Look, Listen. In the three weeks leading up to the election, we'll be sitting down for conversations with three voters who have made a choice for president, and they're ready to talk about it. So mark your calendar for Tuesday, October 15th for the first installment that we hope will offer you a sounding board as you consider your own decision at the polls. We will be right back. In late August, the human rights organization Christian Solidarity International reported that jihadists had walked into a church and slit the throats of 26 Christians during a worship service in the West African country of Burkina Faso, where Islamic insurgents now control 60% of the country. 
Whether or not you're seeing these headlines in your newsfeed, tragic stories like these are playing out in pockets all around the world. According to a new report released this month from the U.S.-based persecution watchdog International Christian Concern, Christians account for 70% of religious killings in Nigeria, in India and Azerbaijan, Corrupt governments advance the oppression of religious minorities in all facets of daily life. And in Myanmar, where a civil war has been going on for years, persecution has worn down the fabric of a nation struggling to find peace by turning neighbor against neighbor in deadly conflict. Now, many of these countries are seemingly a world away from us here in the U.S., but former diplomat and defender of global religious freedom, Knox Thames, argues that their freedom is inextricably connected to our own. Knox is the author of Ending Persecution, Charting the Path to Global Religious Freedom, and we're so glad to have him joining us here on The Bulletin to talk more about this important topic. Knox, thanks for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. When Americans think of religious freedom, what do you think they think of? And are they right or are they wrong? You know, the American view of it is very much focused on our own domestic religious liberty history and fights. Part of our founding narrative as our nation is persecuted religious minorities in Europe coming to these shores to enjoy religious freedom, to pursue truth as their conscience leads. That's a proud part of our story, something that's given our country vitality and energy and really become a a refuge for people of all faiths who've come to these shores. But at the same time, I think now it's become a political football with right and left fighting over what does it mean as our country becomes more diverse, uh, new faiths, people of no faith, all competing in this marketplace of ideas. But I like to say a bad day in America for religious freedom still is better than a good day in a lot of other places around the world because religious persecution abroad is a life and death question. What does that persecution look like for a person in another country on a daily basis? And in your book, you specifically talk about restrictive environments. What are those and how do these folks who are living under them operate? The uh, situation for religious freedom globally is pretty dark. There are statistics showing that about two out of every three people live in a country that restricts the free practice of faith. That doesn't mean everyone's being persecuted, But there are very narrow lanes of permissible religious activity. And if you want to change lanes, question those lanes, leave the road altogether, you'll face attacks by your government, by your neighbors, sometimes both. And so the lived experience for many people of faith, both Christians and their non-Christian neighbors, is one of fear that if I express what I really believe, if I am true to who I am in a public way, I could be arrested, I could be jailed, tortured, even killed. Neighbors could come and attack, mobs could be stirred up. And we see this in the Middle East, in South Asia, East Asia, Africa. So it's a pandemic of persecution that's impacting every faith community somewhere. And there's a real question about what can we do to at least arrest this slide towards global persecution, if not hopefully turn the tide. One of the things that I found really fascinating that you highlight is that now we do have global governing bodies, right? How well are these working? Yeah, the UN has an important role to play. There are bad actors like China and Pakistan trying to undermine these international norms that the United States played an important role in establishing that defends religious freedom, defines religious freedom in a way that means people are free to choose faith, change faith, have no faith, meet together, educate their children. So there was a meeting on Thanksgiving Day at the Human Rights Council in Geneva, and I had gotten special permission from my family to to miss that holiday to represent the United States at this meeting that was focused on persecuted religious minorities. And, you know, a lot of diplomatic work can be really exciting, but it can also be really boring because you have to listen to speech after speech, but at those details that are really important. But this One woke me up when the folks sitting next to me were a Chinese human rights activist speaking in Chinese. I have to admit, I wasn't probably paying as close of attention as I should have been. But then I heard the Chinese diplomat across this ornate chamber banging the table with her placard, yelling point of order, and was requesting that the chairman stop these Chinese activists from speaking because she didn't like what they were saying. And so it was in up to the rights respecting nations. Austria raised their placard and said, no, sir, like they have the right to speak. I raised the U.S. placard and said, I agree that this is a forum to hear these concerns, not squelch them. 
And so it took the rights respecting world to stand up against Chinese bullying in this environment. And we won the day in the fact that they got to finish their speech. But it's that kind of dedication to these fights that I'm worried we're walking away from because it is becoming increasingly dysfunctional. And that's what the bad guys want. And we created these institutions. We back these institutions. These institutions actually carry our values forward in some really important ways. And if we just throw up our hands and discuss, then the bad guys win. And suddenly it's a lot easier for them to persecute under the patina of UN authority or approval. And so these seemingly painful bureaucratic battles are actually incredibly important for the average person in the streets of Lahore or Riyadh or Lagos that are confronted with violence because of what they believe. One of the words that's been tossed around a lot since the Israel-Hamas war began is the word genocide. And when you're talking about global religious freedom, we're talking about China and Burma and places on the continent of Africa. And help me understand, from a global religious freedom perspective, what constitutes genocide? There's a very specific definition of genocide under the Convention Against It. That was one of the first documents that the United Nations passed in 1947. It factors in intent, capabilities, and we've certainly seen that. When I was in a special envoy position during the Obama administration and then the Trump administration focused on religious minorities, we went through these big internal battles about can we label what ISIS was doing against Yazidis and Christians and others in northern Iraq at the time a genocide. And it was a really tough fight. We won it with both administrations. My concern was more, yes, it's good to be rhetorically correct, but how does that actually help people on the ground who are the victims? It didn't really unlock any new doors or any new resources. It was the right thing to say, but if we weren't going to then really go all in and helping these communities in Iraq, and since there have been genocide determinations for China against the Uyghur Muslims and Burma against Rohingya Muslims, there needs to be consequences for what the United States says. You know, I talk about if, if we believe human rights really matters and it really needs to matter in how we conduct our international affairs. And so, of course, we want to be rhetorically correct and we have a huge light we can shine on situations of abuse, and persecution and genocide. But then we have to make sure our policies follow up the rhetoric so that there are consequences or the bad guys will realize we can just ignore it for this press cycle and continue on our merry oppressive way. This is a great use of American influence and stewarding our influence in a way that reflects our values, again, because this is part of our founding narrative, but also our interests, because we know when countries abuse and persecute to the actually trying to wipe out a people group, it leads to instability, violence, and a host of other ills that will touch us in other ways that are ultimately against what we're trying to achieve globally. How does a country get to this place of an extreme form of religious persecution? And is it a slippery slope that sort of escalates quickly? Or is this a long winding journey that maybe in a place like Burkina Faso could be halted long before we end up getting to mass graves and such an appalling mistreatment of human life? First and foremost, there's like the hard education of are people arrested when they do evil? Is there accountability? Because if there isn't, it creates a climate of impunity and people learn the wrong lessons. I can get away with this. I can do it again. And then there's the education that's preventative about just working with kids to help them understand that every individual has human rights and religious freedom, that people who are of a different background, religiously, ethnically, they're not to be feared. They're actually your neighbor. And how do we start to inoculate kids to the virus that actually leads them to commit these horrible verbal abuses. So this is where we can be a lot better in encouraging proper law enforcement on the ground. It's like the nuts and bolts of the responsibility of governance and educating kids, not just on reading, writing, and arithmetic, but on teaching them tolerance, how to get along with people who are different than them. And so, you know, I wish there were silver bullets or some sort of magic wand that would fix everything, but it's going to be a long our journey that's going to have to be nuanced and cultivated to each specific environment. You know, what would work in Burkina Faso wouldn't work in Pakistan or wouldn't work in China. But there are some commonalities that I think we can build upon if we have the will and the interest to do so. 
those ideas of tolerance seem so high-minded. And I kind of want to press in on this. So Western, can these educational reforms actually work in countries that are not democratic, that have a very tribal mentality? I think of some of these countries on the continent of Africa who were colonized, who have had their borders shifted so many times that there's not a cohesive sense of national identity. There's no easy solution. I think this is where finding partners across different faiths is really important. You know, I'm Christian, I'm evangelical, I'm trying to inspire our brothers and sisters to pray and advocate for our own, but also the persecuted neighbors out of a belief of Christ's command to love your neighbor. I have friends who are Muslim who are working within their scriptural tradition to advocate for the rights of religious minorities, that they shouldn't be treated differently from the Muslim majority in a Muslim majority context. I have Hindu friends who are doing that, Buddhist friends. And so it's it's about finding these points of light and trying to knit them together into something that is actually more powerful than their individual efforts alone. It's hard for, you know, when I was a diplomat, a white Christian American going into an Islamic context, I, it's not for me to tell them what they believe, but there are those voices who are working within their own faith to be that positive voice. And I think that's where we need to build and nurture and grow both within our own community and our other friends' community so that we can start to make a difference. One of the things that I thought was interesting about this new study from the ICC that I mentioned at the top of the segment was that in Pakistan, empirical evidence, the study said, suggested that corruption and religious persecution have detrimental effects on the country's economic growth. And I wonder if that's a way in, you know, money talks. Can we convince countries that religious freedom is actually for their good from an economic standpoint if it doesn't work from the sort of higher ideals of democracy that we as Westerners espouse? I think it's like yes to everything. Let's let's do a full court press and whatever sticks, let's go with. And again, like I said, it's going to be specific to the country. But for sure, environments that have religious freedom are more creative, more innovative, because you see, you know, freedom of religion is really freedom of belief, freedom of conscience, explore, ask, question, innovate. And those are going to be environments that have a good return on investment. And we've seen a country like the United Arab Emirates, which is a conservative Islamic country, they kind of get this. And they've built churches, they've built a Sikh temple and a Hindu temple, and they just built a synagogue because they understand it's good for business. If people can come here and pray the way they want to pray and and worship the way they want to worship, that's going to add vitality and energy. So I often would point to like, hey, see what this little country on the Persian Gulf is doing. They've figured something out here. And to your point, yeah, look at this. It can actually be in your interest. You may not care about religious freedom, but you care about having resources and income. It can help you out. Yeah. If it makes a difference in your GDP, you may be willing to listen. Knox, you grew up in Kentucky, deep in the Bible Belt, where the desire for religious freedom is sort of, it's in the groundwater almost. And I'm always fascinated by how folks come to what they have dedicated their lives to. And, you know, in closing, I think for the average American, these stories are far away. How, as a boy from Kentucky, did these stories draw near for you? And how do you think in reflecting on your journey toward diplomacy and in defense of religious freedom, there is a pathway for the ordinary American Christian to have a renewed interest or a growing interest in the religious freedom around the world? When I was growing up in central Kentucky, I've looked at census data. It was the second most homogeneous state in the country at the time. There just wasn't a lot of diversity, but my parents were educators working at a Eastern Kentucky University, and they would bring in professors and exchange students into our home. So I would get to meet a Muslim professor from Iran or a Thai exchange student who is Buddhist. And that always had interested me and went to a little Baptist school in central Kentucky. And then, But afterwards, what was really formative, I joined World Relief's office in Atlanta as an AmeriCorps volunteer to do refugee resettlement. And so for the first time in my life, I had friends who had been horribly persecuted because they were from the wrong tribe and wrong religion. And I felt like as a Christian, we are called to help these people. And as an American, with all the resources and blessings we've had as our country, we have an obligation to help these people. It both aligns with my beliefs, 
Luke 10, the parable of the Good Samaritan, someone crossing religious and ethnic lines to help someone who was different than them and the command to go and do likewise, that's love of neighbor. But then also with our national values of we believe that religious freedom matters. We want this to be a part of our foreign policy. I think we should be the first speaking up for anyone who's persecuted for what they believe. Yes, we want them to join our community, but because they're made in God's image, because we believe in human dignity, we're going to stand up for them if they're Christian, Muslim, atheist, Hindu, Buddhist, whomever. For then the average person, this begins as a relationship, right? It begins as helping out with an ESL class at your local library and meeting someone who is different from you. Resettlement services, like you're describing. Absolutely. Any kind of outreach to your neighbors who are new or trying to establish themselves, it begins there, doesn't it? I had a conversation at Walmart where the lady checking me out her name looked to be like she was Uyghur Muslim. And so I said, are you Uyghur? She was like shocked. I knew. And I said, your community is really suffering. How are you? And she was just astounded. Someone knew that. So, you know, of course we want all these people to join our community, to know Jesus Christ. But I think a lot of this work is pre-evangelical. Like how are we going to have the relational standing for them to hear about what matters to us if we've ignored them in their darkest hour because they're not one of us? Listeners, alongside of praying for the persecuted church, we can and should pray for all those who are persecuted for their faith, even those who do not yet call Jesus Lord. Thanks so much for this conversation, Knox, and for your work on behalf of the vulnerable. We will be right back. On Sunday, the Daily Mail reported that actor Russell Brand, a new convert to Christianity, had posted an image of himself conducting a river baptism in his underwear. Brand has been outspoken about his conversion in the last few months, posting frequently to social media about the change of mind that has come as he has learned fundamental Christian principles like the incarnation of Jesus and salvation by grace. But mixed up in all of this has been Brand's increasing companionship with and ardent support for Republican and MAGA celebrities, including Tucker Carlson, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Vivek Ramaswamy, and Jordan Peterson. Mike and Nicole and Russell, this recent story about Brand actually makes me want to dive a little bit deeper beneath this headline to ask a question that author Jake Medor asks in a CT book review that he did for us a while back. And it's been noodling around in my brain when I see headlines like this. Is celebrity Christianity okay at all? Jake writes, from my perspective, Christian celebrity looks like a lizard we should kill rather than continue carrying around, however cautiously or reluctantly. It's possible I'm wrong, of course, and that calling on Christian leaders to distance themselves from social media, break up with their megachurches into smaller neighborhood parishes, and fully repudiate the lavish lifestyles of Hillsong preachers is asking too much. But when I survey the American church today, I see no reason to think celebrity of any sort should be preserved. And I see many reasons to think it's leading us to hell. And so, Russell, I've got to ask, can celebrity Christianity be redeemed or do we need to kill the lizard? I think there's a difference between saying celebrity Christianity when what you mean are well-known Christian preachers. That's always going to be the case. I remember there was someone saying to me very early when I came into Christianity Today, we ought to have no uh, celebrity Christians. I said, well, you can either say that or you can talk about the fact that this was a media platform founded by Billy Graham, but we can't do both. The reason that Billy Graham was a quote unquote celebrity was not because he was a celebrity. It's because he was preaching the gospel in a uniquely impactful sort of way. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's going to be the case uh, really regardless and has all the way back to the book of Acts. There's a different question, though, when we're talking about the way that we see celebrity in and of itself. And that's what worries me every time that we have a high profile convert to Christianity. And that happens whether it's at the kind of global fame level of a Russell Brand or Kanye West or uh, before that an Anne Rice or at the local level. There's the high school uh, captain of the football team has uh, come to faith in Christ, and that person is immediately put behind a microphone. What we end up doing is to suggest, wow, 
we have this person on our side now. That means that Jesus is really worth your uh, paying attention to, which is completely opposite of what James 2 is teaching about don't do that. I was talking to a very well-known person one time who came to faith in Christ, but who hadn't told anybody. And I thought, this is kind of Nicodemus, you know, don't be ashamed of the gospel, come forward. And he said, I'm not ready. I'm not discipled enough to be talking about this. And that's exactly the case. So you end up with people who end up not only destroying themselves often, but also uh, hurting the witness of Christ. I mean, the very idea of somebody who is just suddenly saying, I'm a Christian, now leading groups of people in the Lord's Prayer and baptizing people. I saw someone who said the other day, who was a Catholic sort of apologist, saying the, uh, the best argument for converting to the Roman Catholic Church is there's no danger you'll ever be baptized by Russell Brand and his tidy white. <laughs> Bring also- back <laughs> clerical robes. Period. Yes. <laughs> the best argument for it I've ever seen in my entire life. At least. Baptismal robes. Yes. It's not that Russell Brand is teaching and discipling people and baptizing people because he has matured in grace and godliness. It's because he's Russell Brand, known for all of the Russell Brand hijinks. And now he happens to be a Christian. We can adopt him as ours. I think that's very dangerous. Nicole, Russell posted Russell Brand posted. It might seem a bit soon to be baptizing people, but the apostles did it on day one. So here we are. So talk to me about the enthusiasm of a new convert. How would you disciple that person? When I first came into ministry, at first I was a a young adult minister, young adult singles, and then I got into discipleship and I loved it. And we did this Billy Graham Evangelical Association training and they talk about the zeal of the new convert. And they say, when a person is first converted, they are actually the best candidate to tell other people about Jesus. I think that needs to be encouraged by every church, by every pastor. Once you have accepted Christ, once you've made this decision, please go tell other people people. That training does not say, now go and serve the Lord's Supper. It does not say, now go and baptize or marry people, because those are sacraments of the ordained ministry of the church. I absolutely love seeing people who are very well known come to Jesus. My deep challenge is, who is discipling them and how? I remember a dear friend of mine who's a pastor was preaching a sermon and who comes up to the front? It was a very well-known musical artist came and accepted Christ at their church. They were thrilled. They said, look, we need to get you in a small group. We need to, you know, help you understand what the word is. The guy says, I'm traveling every week. You know, there's no way I can do that, but I'll come back next year when I'm in town. That's a reality. And I understand that. But without discipling, there can be no understanding of what this faith is about and without discipling, there's no chance that you could possibly be prepared to sustain the ordinances of the church. And baptism is one of those ordinances. That's exactly right. And that's one of the things, the zeal of a new convert to tell everybody about Jesus and what has happened is exactly right. I mean, that's exactly what happened with the Samaritan woman and the Mm. well is what happened with the demoniac. It's happened with the lepers. That's to be encouraged and fueled into a flame. But what you see here is not just the exaltation of uh, celebrities. You also see the trivialization of baptism. That happened a long time before we get to Russell Brand. You have in church life right now, even in really good churches, baptism is, you know, we're going to have a baptism later this afternoon out in the foyer for whoever wants to be there. Mm. When in reality, if you think about whatever our differences on baptism, this is the fundamental sign of union with Christ, of death, burial, and resurrection, it should not be outsourced out to somebody in his underwear grinning for an iPhone shoot. And it also shouldn't be just kind of pushed to the side in our churches. As somebody from the Baptist tradition, I noticed this happening when we started spending so much more time talking about what baptism was not than talking about what it is. All of this, making sure everybody knows that we're not Catholic. There's nothing in this water that can wash away a sin. This is an outward sign of an inward reality. 
rather than talking about also what's really significant and weighty about what Jesus is saying through his body with this act. And it's been trivialized. We need to reclaim it. This is a minor thing. We talked about the baptismal robes. I don't think there's anything biblically mandated about that, but I do think that it signified the weight of the congregation, that this is not just some body. You're not baptizing yourself with somebody helping you. The body of Christ, you're being baptized into the body of Christ. That's significant. And I think we've lost it in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. If I can take that even a step further, I'm half joking about clerical robes, but I'm really only half joking because the whole idea of clerical robes is this idea that the persona disappears, right? Like the clerical robe becomes the persona for the minister doing the work. And they stand there and they represent the church. They represent a certain sense of authority of the word of God and the people of God. And very clearly what's going on in that picture with Russell Brand is it's about Russell Brand. It's not about the person getting baptized. It's not about Jesus. It's not about the story that's being told. Back to the beginning when you were talking about the celebrity need to die. If you press into the language There's a distinction in the difference between fame and celebrity. A celebrity is somebody who knows how to operate in a media culture and be celebrated by media. They're famous for being famous. And the Kardashians are the ultimate example of this, of somebody who really just understands how do I stay relevant and in the media. And the church should have absolutely zero interest in this whatsoever. But when we talk about a person like Billy Graham, Billy Graham understood media, but Billy Graham was famous for his message. Back to sort of Roman culture even, like the whole idea of fame was great men and women who had done great deeds who would be remembered after their death. And there's something to the cloud of witnesses, the heroes of the church, the people who who we remember, the people we memorialize as saints. There's something good in that. We could probably sit here and come up with a few names of people that we go, you know, thank God for these people. I hope they're remembered. I hope Tim Keller is remembered for the next 200 years. But he's not going to be remembered because of his media savvy. He's going to be remembered for the impact he made in hearts and minds and the ordinary lives of the people around him. We also need to keep in mind what our responsibilities are. I mean, when you're dealing with people who are already very vulnerable, for whom fame is a way, as one person put it, of trying to find kindness they think ahead of time, and it ends up actually being the reverse, and then they're used as props or they're allowed to simply think, I mean, Russell Brand may well think this is just what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. You have to have people there who are like, hey, no, 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 come and be discipled. And without that, we hurt them. I've found that people who are really, really well-known do have significant voids that they're trying to fill. And perhaps the best thing we can do is to remind them of who they really are. You are not your music. You are not the number of times you showed up on this TV show or this ad or this commercial. You are a child of God. And this is where I think the discipleship comes in. And it would be wonderful for churches to really consider what does it look like to disciple people who may already have some level of notoriety. Variety. There's got to be a way where we say, if you are very busy or if you have some level of notoriety, we as the body of Christ will remind you of who you are. And that way, when you do go in front of the crowds and all of that, you're not seeing yourself as that thing, but you see yourself as part of us, an extension of the body of Christ called to obey and to bear witness. And it's about who you are. And that's what the body of Christ is uniquely set up to do. I remember talking to a pastor in Nashville who had many, many people in his congregation that were famous and influential. He said the two things that he pushed all the time with these folks was the prayer closet and the unseen deed. Find a way to live out your spirituality that is hidden. And until you have a grounded sense of spiritual practices and spiritual disciplines that nobody knows about, don't even talk about your faith publicly. The temptation for it to become performative will overwhelm you. And then the second one was find the least of these, whoever that is for you, and commit yourself to serving in a way that you're not going to talk about publicly. You're not going to make this part of your platform. You're not going to make this part of your brand. And you're going to be committed to it and do it for a season before you bring your faith out onto the stage with you. 
because it coming home from a, a tour or finishing a movie and coming back to your local church and then going to that group of addicts or whatever and coming back to those real life problems and serving those people and praying for those people in a way that nobody sees, that's grounding in, in ways that you, you can't fully describe. That's such a good word for all of us. We are our brother and sister's keepers. So before you go liking a celebrity social media post, consider the unhealthy dopamine hit that you get when someone likes yours and maybe simply pray for that person that they know their belovedness in Christ. Mike, Russell, Nicole, thanks for this conversation. Listeners, we'll see you next week. The Bulletin is a production of Christianity Today. It's produced by Clarissa Mall. The associate producer is Leslie Thompson. This episode was mixed by TJ Hester. Theme music by Dan Phelps. Eric Petrick and Mike Cosper are the executive producers of CT Media Podcasts, and Matt Stevens is our senior producer. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a rating and review to help more people find the show. Thanks for listening. <laughs>